welcome to this video lecture from the Mortar Bus Archive. We will look at how different sources of information and documents can be used to tell a story from the history of Mortar's bus industry using the principles of jigsaw theory as discussed in the first video lecture. This lecture is called Back to the Beginning and in it we are going to go right back to the earliest days of Mortar's motor buses. With documents that far back few in number, often we need to try and trace surviving photographs. We start with this well-known view of an open-top double-deck bus. The image was taken by the famous photographer Richard Ellis, and I would like to thank Richard's great-grandson Ian Ellis for allowing some of the Ellis archives photos to be used in this video. The photograph may be well known, but there are four key questions that need to be answered. What do we know about the company that operated the buses? What do we know about the vehicles they used? Who were the people in the photograph? And when and where was the photograph taken? As we answer these questions, we'll also answer a fifth. What sources of information are available to use over 100 years later? Several modern era books mention E.T. Ajus and Company and the Mortar Omnibus and Transport Syndicate, as well as the years 1905 and 1906. These books include Mortar, Portrait of an Era, a collection of photographs from the Richard Ellis archive, and the Mortar Buses, first published in the 1980s and written by Michael Cassar and the late Joseph Benici. But what contemporary written sources are there? So far, no mentions of the bus company have been found in the English language newspapers from the time, and a search of the Maltese language papers by a Maltese speaking volunteer has still to be carried out. Surviving vehicle files in Malta only go back to the first half of the 1930s at best, so do not cover the period we are interested in. There is a trade magazine called Commercial Motor, published in the UK. It is still available to this day and primarily covers the road freight industry. However, many of their early editions, including the early years of the 20th century, covered buses too, and many of these early editions have now been digitised and are available online. A search of their archive has unearthed several articles that mention Malta's first buses. In their edition dated the 6th of April 1905, mention is made of a four-cylinder, 20-horsepower omnibus having been sent to Malta for trials by the Thornycroft Company in the UK. The article also refers to a local company having been set up to carry out commercial motor work, though the article fails to mention the name of the company or who was behind it. Mention is also made of three vehicles having been ordered. One 20 horsepower 16 passenger single decker, one 24 horsepower 36 passenger double decker, and one five ton lorry for goods traffic. Then, a fortnight later, mention is made in a round up of news items that a further three double deckers had been ordered. The original article included a photograph of the rear of the demonstrator bus parked on a steep hill. A search of the Richard Ellis archives records found that image and two others of the bus. All appear to have been taken in late February 1905, based on the dates of other photographs listed in the Ellis archive ledger books. So let's start with the image that appeared in Commercial Motor. The location is the steep road that these days is one way leading down from Sa'aya in Rabat to the main road that then heads north towards Valletta. The bus and photographer seem to have generated quite some interest from the gathered locals. Note the large cogwheel and drive chain which links the rear axle to the power coming from the engine at the front. The next Richard Ellis image also shows the bus parked up in Rabat in late February 1905. The first thing of note are the tiered bench seats. In the UK at the time, this type of seating layout was known as being a charabang, and is probably why buses in Malta were for a number of decades known as charabangs, despite none being to the charabang layout shown here. The next thing to note is that the size of the rear wheels are much larger than the front wheels. We will come back to that later in this lecture. Note also the very early style of radiator, again we will mention that later, and just how small the steering wheel was, which must have made driving the bus very heavy, especially as it would have only been driven at very low speeds, 
by modern day standards. The colour of the bus is not known, but the photograph suggests that the base colour was quite light in shade and that a darker colour was used for lining. The fact that on the photo the lining shows as a dark grey suggests the lining was coloured rather than black. If we zoom into the front wheel, a form of tuberfil is painted on the spokes with bands around the wheel itself. This accent colour does not appear to be black either, as again on this photograph it is a darker grey rather than black. The final image of the demonstrator shows the bus emerging from a building that appears to have the words Petroleum Tanks Limited on the outside. Note also the narrow gauge rail lines under the bus linking the interior and exterior of the building. But where was this building? One guess is the Zira Manuel Island area of Martam Shet Harbour, the other being somewhere around the Grand Harbour. We shall come back to the people in the photograph later in this lecture. Returning to the archives of Commercial Motor, the edition dated the 16th of November 1905 gives more details about the new bus operation on Malta. It states that the scheme was conceived by Mr Edward Tancred Ajus, a Maltese gentleman who had been living in London for many years. His brother-in-law, Major Muscat, of the King's Own Malta Regiment, was also involved. They had formed a syndicate but it did not name who else was involved. The operation started on the 2nd of October 1905 after a religious ceremony by Monsignor Muscat, which included the blessing of the new buses. The initial route was between Kingsgate, just outside Valletta, and the army camp at Pembroke, travelling via Mceda, Slema and St Julian's. A large garage had been built and a pair of photographs were shown to illustrate this, again using images taken by Richard Ellis for the company. Looking at the first of these images, taken just before the launch, this shows the garage site was triangular in shape and that the building was actually still being built, with just the central section complete, with several of the double-deckers visible. The second image shows part of the interior of the central section of the new building. Four double-deckers and the single-decker are visible in this image. More about the depot building and the uses to which it was put will be covered in another video lecture. Returning again to the Commercial Motor Archives, the next mention is not until the 28th of December 1911. This article states that the operation, having started in October 1905, only lasted 14 months, suggesting it had stopped by the end of 1906. It further went on to say that there had been plenty of traffic but that reasons for the failure of the company included the inexperience of the drivers and the poor state of the roads, the latter leading to the use of iron tyres on the buses towards the end. At the time of the article, late 1911, the only mechanical road transport in Malta were the steam traction engines and tractors belonging to the government and military. It also stated that other than the railway and tramway, only horse-drawn transport existed. The article seems to have ignored that a small but growing number of cars were in use at the time. The article does however suggest that in 1911 there were no motor buses running on either of the islands. The 28th of December 1911 article also includes a very small and undated offside photograph of a single deck bus with number 3 visible. It suggested that maybe the double-decker that had been number three had been rebuilt to single deck, but by whom and when? The image has so far not appeared in the Ellis archives, suggesting someone else had taken the photograph. Therefore, all we can do is show the image as it appeared in the magazine. Finally, in this part of the lecture, a mention of the 1905-06 bus operation has been found in the publication entitled Progress, Volume 1, Issue 6, dated the 2nd of April 1906. 
This lists the formal name of the operating company as being the Malta Motor Omnibus and Transport Syndicate Limited. It also states that the return journey is made three times in the morning and six times in the afternoon. Four buses are used each day, running in shifts, averaging about 9 to 12 hours of use each. The buses ran around 360 miles a day in total, making an annual total mileage of 48,000 miles. It will thus be seen that each bus ran around 90 miles a day. It also stated that the average number of stops per trip was 15. The number of passengers carried per bus each day was between 200 and 300. The buses were reported to be running very satisfactorily, with the fifth bus being kept at the depot as a spare. The buses were recorded as being fitted with World's tyres made by Shrewsbury and Challoner in the UK. Single tyres were fitted to the front wheels and twin tyres to the rear. Pratt's motor spirit was the fuel used in the buses. It was estimated that five miles were done to the gallon, making the daily consumption across the four buses around 72 gallons, or 18 gallons per bus per day. Finally, the article mentioned that three men were employed at the garage to carry out maintenance work, and there were a further four fatigue men. Two people were employed on each bus, one to drive, earning 28 shillings per week, and one to collect the fares, earning 21 shillings per week. Returning to the actual vehicles, what do we know about the fleet? Another Richard Ellis photo dating from just before the launch shows all six Thornycroft vehicles lined up. Number one was the 16-passenger single-decker. Numbers two to five were the 36-passenger double-deckers. Number six was the lorry. The buses were, as mentioned, built by Thornycroft in Basingstoke. Their build records survive in the Hampshire County Council Thornycroft archive. These have been transcribed and can be viewed at the website address shown on the screen now. These records list the following. Chassis 375 was used to build the 20 horsepower 16 seat Sharaban, bus number one. The delivery date, probably actually the date it left the factory, is listed as being the 11th of March 1906. We'll come back to that shortly. Chassis 452 was used to build the 24 horsepower lorry, listed as delivered on the 6th of May 1905. Chassis 453 was used to build the first of the 36 passenger double deckers, bus number 2. Chassis 502, 503, and 504 were the other three double deckers, buses 3, 4, and 5, that had been ordered slightly later and were listed as delivered between mid-August and mid-September 1905. These were also listed as being model 80B4 chassis, suggesting there may have been a slight difference between these three and the first one. Certainly, looking at the photograph, there were minor differences around the front of the bus between number two and the other three. A photograph of a 24 horsepower Thornycroft chassis appears in the edition of Commercial Motor dated the 23rd of November 1906. The build records list that bus 1 was not delivered until March 1906, but the Ellis photograph dated early October 1905 clearly shows the bus was in the fleet by then. Therefore 1906 must be an error. Note also that bus 1 has the larger rear wheel and early style of radiator that the demonstrator had. It is believed that the chassis of the demonstrator was rebodied with a saloon style single deck body. It is not known if this was done back in the UK or if the body was shipped out to Malta from the UK. Indeed it is not even known if this single deck body was built in the UK or possibly even built in Malta. It is presumed that the Sharabang style body was returned to Thornycroft one way or another. Looking at the build dates for chassis with similar numbers to chassis 375, a date of the first half of 1904 seems most likely, 
Maybe the reference to March 1906 should read March 1904. This would tie in with the date of December 1904 quoted in Commercial Motor for the bus arriving in Malta. We have looked at two contemporary sources of information so far, the Richard Ellis photographs and articles in period publications such as Commercial Motor and Progress. But what other sources are there that can be referenced? In the records held at the National Archives of Malta in their headquarters in Rabat, there are correspondence files between the various parties and the Lieutenant Governor's Office, also known as the Chief Secretary to the Government files. One file, CSG02-2344-1905, contains a letter from Major Muscat dated the 29th of September 1905, a few days before the planned launch of the bus service. He flags up a problem that had come to light with the double-deck buses going under the railway bridge at the top of Princess Melita Road, the road leading up from the harbour at Pieta. The letter suggests that a new access point be created parallel to the road that would allow the buses to cross the railway lines by means of a level crossing, the bus company paying for the cost of providing a point man to ensure safety at the crossing. The file also contained a very handy diagram. This showed the problem that existed. Whilst the buses themselves could pass under the arch of the bridge, when passengers were sat upstairs, there was not quite enough room for them to comfortably pass through, especially those sat nearest the outside edges of the bus. The diagram also gives very useful dimensions for the bus, details that had not survived in any other documentary sources. At its widest, the bus was 7 feet wide, around 2.1 metres. At its tallest, it was 11 feet 6 inches tall, around 3.5 metres. Whilst there was around 5 feet, about 1.5 metres clearance between the top of the bus and the highest part of the archway, this rapidly decreased away from the central point. The part of the seats passengers sat on were only 10 inches, around 25 centimetres, below the highest point of the bodywork. When passengers were sat on the upper deck, their heads were around 3 feet, just under 1 metre, above the top of the bus. Add on a hat, and those sat on the outer edges of the top deck would have come into contact with the stonework of the arch. As the railway company were not keen to create a new level crossing, an alternative plan was submitted, which would have seen the alignment used for horse-drawn traffic taken over by the bus company. The new part of road would be lowered, and the archway replaced with a flat iron bridge, rather than a stone archway. Again, the work would have been paid for by the bus company. Although these plans were approved of in principle by some of those consulted, as the alignment was also possibly going to be used for an extension of the tram network, which would have seen a route created round to Slema, the government decided to turn down the application in December 1905. The company was basically told that they knew the height of the bridge when they ordered their buses, so it was their fault if things were too tight. They were also told that any passengers sitting upstairs would have to alight from the bus when it passed under the bridge before getting back on the bus. This may explain why bus 3 was apparently rebuilt as a single decker. So, who were the people involved with this new bus operation? We mentioned that the leading man was Edward Tancred Ajus, known as ETA by his family. Having lived in England for so long, he changed the pronunciation of his surname to an anglicised form, Aegis, and I shall use that from now on. He was born in 1849 in Alexandria in Egypt, where his father was working at the time. He was educated in various places, including Paris in France. In 1868, when he was only 19, he moved to London to start his own business. His father, Tancred, was a wealthy merchant. When he died in 1872, 
ETA became head of the family. In 1873, he married Maria Conchetta Muscat in Valletta before returning with her to London. He set up the Edward Tancred Aegis and Company Limited to act as a coal shipping business with offices around the world, including one prominently located at Lascaris Wharf, Valletta. The company later became involved in the import of petrol and oil into Malta via St Paul Petroleum Tanks Limited, and this appears to be the full name of the company that appeared in the photograph of the demonstrator bus. This business was later sold on to Standard Oil from the USA, though ETA remained a director of Standard's Malta-based business. He jointly set up the Malta Import and Export Agency, which the 1905 bus company ultimately came under. He died in Hampstead, a district of North London, in 1924, aged 75. Major Joseph Muscat was born in Valletta in 1858. Much of his adult life was spent in the military. He was ETA's brother-in-law, Muscat's sister having married ETA in 1873. In 1898, he was recorded as being a major in the King's Own Malta Regiment of Militia and served in the Second Boer War in South Africa. He acted as ETA's right-hand man in Malta, running the Maltese end of the business empire on a day-to-day -day basis. He died at the relatively young age of 49 in June 1908. Joseph Louis Muscat was born in 1885 in Valletta. He was Major Muscat's son and so nephew of ETA. He took over his father's role in ETA's business empire when the Major died in 1908. He served as a lieutenant in the KOMR and in October 1915 served at Gallipoli as an officer running the Malta Labour Corps. He is listed as serving in a number of other capacities during World War I, including the King's Royal Rifle Corps and the Munster Fusiliers, by which time he had obtained the rank of captain. After World War I, he returned to Malta to continue running the Malta Import and Export Agency and the Maltese end of his uncle's business empire. The MI and EA still owned the 1905 bus carriage and ran a car hire and maintenance business from there until around 1920, when they moved to Tower Road, Sleema, and eventually several other locations. We should take a more detailed look at the garage site and the many uses it was put to in the next video lecture. In the late 1920s, he was appointed the first police traffic officer, the post later being known as traffic manager. He served as the secretary to the traffic control board in his capacity as traffic manager when the board was established in 1930. In World War II, he served as a captain in the Royal Intelligence Corps and served in India. He died in 1957 at the age of 71. Frank Denaro was born in 1868 in Valletta. He was ETA's son-in-law, having married one of his daughters in July 1901. He served as a captain in the KOMR. He was listed in early 1906 as working as a manager at the bus company and was probably running it on a day-to-day -day basis for ETA and Major Muscat. When the Major died in 1908, he took on a senior role with JL Muscat running the Malta side of ETA's empire. He remained in the military too and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel by the time his 1920 passport was issued. He died in 1947, aged 79. William Spiller was born in Essex in the UK in 1869. This is believed to possibly be him stood beside the demonstrator bus in the 1905 petroleum tanks photograph taken by Richard Ellis. He died in 1936 in Tolworth, Surrey. The following pieces of information about him come from entries in Commercial Motor magazine between 1905 and 1907. He worked as an apprentice for three years at the Bow Locomotive Works of the North London Railway. He worked for a number of years for Thornycroft, initially on the marine side of the business and then in the fledgling bus business. 
With the buses, he would often take them to various locations to prove that they could cope with the conditions of that place. He accompanied the demonstrator bus that came to Malta in December 1904. Looking in the custom house records held at the National Archives of Malta in Rabat, he arrived on the French-owned ship, the Duke of Brigance, on the 22nd of December 1904, and departed on the SS Ville d'Algar, or the city of Algiers, on the 16th of March 1905. If the demonstrator bus was not on the ship he arrived on, it would have arrived in Malta fairly close to the date William arrived. Malta may have been his last project for Thornycroft, as by July 1905 he was recorded as being the superintendent of the motor department of the London General Omnibus Company. Around 1906 he became the general manager and engineer at the Gearless Motor Omnibus Company Limited. In May 1907 he was appointed chairman of the Society of Motor Omnibus Engineers, and after that, the trail goes cold somewhat, until a final mention is found in the 1911 UK census, where he is found living in Moss Lane East in Manchester, and his profession is listed as manager for a motor vehicle manufacturing company, though sadly it does not list which one. Now let us have a look at what we know about a couple of the drivers employed by the ETA-owned bus company. Giuseppe Grishti was born in Malta in the mid-1860s. He appears in four police occurrence book entries in 1905 and 1906, confirming his status as a bus driver. He was the father of the Grishti brothers who built a number of bus bodies in the 1920s and 1930s and ran the various red wheel garages. We will talk more about the brothers in the next video lecture. He is believed to be the man sat on the step of bus 3 in the ETA star photo shown earlier in this lecture. Giuseppe Lanfranco was born around 1877. He is also listed in several police occurrence book entries as driving the buses of 1905-1906. He is also mentioned in two 1920s police occurrence book entries. The first, dated mid-August 1923, lists him driving bus 702 for the modern garage of Slema. The second entry, from December 1925, lists him driving car for hire number 436. So far, he is the only person confirmed as driving buses in both the 1905-06 operation and the 1920s when the bus industry restarted on a permanent basis. The photograph comes from his 1919 passport application where he is listed as being an engine fitter and that he was planning to travel to Canada. If he did go, he was back in Malta by 1923. Police occurrence book records from the Slema, Hamroon and Floriana divisions for 1905 and 1906 have enabled a list of around 20 staff to be compiled, mostly drivers and a full list is shown on this slide. In some cases, the spelling of the name is uncertain due to the trouble deciphering the handwriting of the entry. Many of the people listed will appear in the staff photo with bus number three, dating from October 1905, but in most cases, it has so far not been possible to match up faces with names. If you recognize any of the names and can supply more information about that individual, please get in touch with the Malta Bus Archive. We shall pause here briefly so you can read the list of names in full. On the 10th of February 1906, there was a tragic fatal accident at the bus garage, probably the first fatality in the Malta bus industry. On the afternoon of the 10th, Giorgio Nicholas Virtue, listed as being a fitter and driver, was driving bus one, the single deck bus built on the chassis of the demonstrator, back into the garage. He had taken the bus out for a trial run after some maintenance. With him were assistant driver Salvatore Quintano and senior driver Ruggiero Gulomia. As they entered the garage, Gulomia got off the bus 
apparently to check something with the engine, but managed to get himself into a position between bus one and another parked bus. He was crushed between the vehicles and despite being rushed to hospital, died around six hours later at 10.15 p.m. A number of other members of staff were listed as being witnesses. The Daily Malta Chronicle also reported on the incident, though gave a subtly different take on the incident and also listed his injuries. Virtue, as being driver of bus one at the time, appeared before the police magistrates, but after a full examination of all the evidence, was acquitted of being to blame for the death, which was listed as just being a tragic accident. Finally for this section, you will have noticed in the Ellis photographs that none of the buses carried a registration plate. According to an entry in the book A History of Malta Police by Edward Attard, in May 1908 the first motor vehicle regulations were issued. Motor cars had to carry a number which had to be affixed in a manner prescribed by the police. As the buses only ran until the end of 1906, this was therefore before the requirement for registration plates had been introduced. They were even known by the large number painted on the sides of each vehicle, numbers 1 to 6, or occasionally by the small white license plate carried on the front of each bus that was similar in size, shape and layout to those carried on the backs of the horse-drawn cabs. We know for sure that bus 4 was 47A and bus 5 was 48A. Buses 2 and 3 may have been 45A and 46A, though I need to review the original glass plate negative of the six vehicle lineup photo in the Richard Ellis archive to be sure. It is not known what number single deck bus 1 and the lorry, later bus 6, carried. The A showed that they were licensed in Police Division A, which covered Valletta and Floriana which of course is where the main office for the ETA Empire was located, on Lascaris Wharf. In this final section of the video lecture, we are going to do a bit of analysis of photographs dating from the era. In the December 1911 edition of Commercial Motor, I mentioned earlier that there had been a small, poorly reproduced photograph of Bus 3, apparently rebuilt as a single-decker. But this generated a couple of questions. Firstly, when was the conversion done? And then, were there any other double-deckers rebuilt like this? A pair of very important photographs have come to light in the family collection of one of the sons of Giuseppe Grishti. This first one was found hanging on the wall of Austin Grishti, and we shall go into detail more about the Grishtis in the next video. The photograph was labelled Thornycroft Bus, and looking in detail at the length of the wheelbase and the design of the front and back axles, it does indeed appear to be one of the 1905 buses rebuilt. Fleet number 4 can just be seen on the side, and the location is the ETA-owned garage in Zira and the people on the bus are some of Giuseppe Grishti's sons. The engine casing is missing and no registration plate is visible. A date on the rear suggests the photograph was taken in 1916. As no motor buses are believed to have been used between 1906 and 1920, and the incomplete state of the front of the bus suggests that it was indeed not in use when the image was taken. The other image taken on the same day appeared in the collection of early family photographs in the care of Austin's nephew, Ray Kushiri. This photograph was taken from a slightly different angle and shows the rear of another similar looking single deck bus in the next section of the garage. This means we can safely say that it appears at least two double deck buses, three and four, were rebuilt to single deck, probably by the end of 1906 and probably by the company themselves. We can also say that two of these buses remained out of use at the garage in 1916, though whether the other bus was number three is not certain. And what happened to the other two double-deckers, two and five, is not known at all at the present. This image shows two single-deck buses in Mceda by the end of the harbour area. 
Zooming in, we lose a lot of the quality, but we can see that the vehicle nearest the camera is number six, the lorry that by the time the photograph had taken had been rebuilt into a basic single deck bus with a canvas roof and bench seats. So far, the earliest mention I have for number six being used as a bus is a police occurrence book entry dated the 17th of March, 1906. The bus behind is certainly not the purpose-built single-decker number one, as the bodywork is more basic. This suggests it is one of the double-deckers rebuilt to single-deck, but the quality of the photo and the angle it was taken at means we can't get a good enough look at the vehicle to confirm this. Finally, let us return to the famous star photo showing bus 3 in early October 1905. Can we now identify any of the people on the bus? The first positive identification we can make is Major Muscat, sat at the front of the upper deck. The next person we can identify is Frank Denaro, stood beside Muscat, as befits his senior position. At the moment, the only other person we might be able to identify is the guy in white trousers sat on the front step of the bus. This is probably Giuseppe Grishti, but we are not 100% certain at this point. Many of those that appeared in the list of staff shown a few minutes ago are also probably in this photo, including Giuseppe Lanfranco and Ruggiero Gulamir, but at the moment they remain unidentified. Again, if you recognise a face of an ancestor, please get in touch as we would love to be able to put another name to a face. If we zoom into the large number three painted on the side of the bus, it becomes clear that these numbers were not black, as had long been presumed, but were of colour with black lining. Similarly, the black circular lining around the number and the lining along the side of the bus have thinner coloured lines too. It is not currently known what these colours were though. If we zoom into the front and rear wheels of the bus, there are tuberfield style lining on the wheel spokes and circles around the outer edges of the wheels. Again, these appear to be of colour, as they show up in the photograph as mid-grey rather than black. Recently, I was able to make use of a one-week three trial of some software designed by Deoldify. This attempted to automatically add colour to old black and white images. It did people and vegetation quite well, but on the whole totally failed to guess what the colour of the vehicles were. However, it managed to do a fair job with two of Richard Ellis's 1905 images. Here we see the staff shot of bus 3 taken in early October 1905, and this suggests that the accent colour of the number may have been red, though red and green tend to show up as the same shade of grey in a black and white photo. The buses were described at the time as being khaki lined out in black. Today, the name khaki gets applied to a number of colours, from cream through beige to jungle green. Back in 1905, the British military referred to a single colour as khaki, the word originating in India and meaning the colour of the earth. Looking at this period photo, we can see that British military khaki was a light beige colour, so the colour the software has chosen for the bus is probably not too far from the truth, though maybe needs to be a shade lighter. The other Ellis photograph that came out quite well is the front view of the demonstrator in Rabat in February 1905. It has coloured the vegetation quite well, but it is not known how accurate the colour of the bus is. It too may have been a similar khaki colour that the main fleet arrived in. The decoration on the wheels is still shown as grey, but as previously discussed was also probably of a currently unknown colour. Thank you for watching this video lecture from the Malta Bus Archive. If you wish to contact us, you can either send an email to maltabusarchive at gmail.com or you can join our Facebook group by searching for Malta Bus Archive. If you wish to see any of our other videos, including clips from videos we have done with people with connections to the bus industry, Go to YouTube and again search for the Malta Bus Archive.